Hey everybody, welcome to Tutor Terrific. This is uh, the final lesson, lesson five of my chapter three of my physics course. We're going to be doing uh, part two of all the projectile motion problem solving techniques. We're going to do a problem with many parts and then a final problem. And uh, we're definitely going to use all of the formulas today, including this guy, the range formula. Well, he'll come back and um, after this lesson, you should be ready to do any introductory college-level projectile motion problems or high school rigor, high, rigorous physics course problems um, in this chapter on two-dimensional projectile motion. Let's begin. All right, we're going to start with these techniques that we've learned so far. I went over this in the end of the last lesson. Let's make sure we remember it. We're going to determine which object or objects are involved, and we're going to draw that picture. If there is not a picture, we need to draw one. Okay, next. We're going to see, sometimes, you're going to see this today, sometimes after you draw the picture, an easy conceptual answer to the problem uh, exists, and you don't have to do any math. That is possible. Also, uh, if that's not what happens, we're going to go on to next ask if the range formula is needed or if it applies. Um, and that's only if the initial and final vertical positions are the same and you are asked for a quantity in the range formula and you know all the others. Uh, you can sort of shortcut this list and stop right there and solve for the unknown quantity using the range formula. If the range formula doesn't apply, we're going to have to use one of those five 2D kinematic equations, two horizontal and or three vertical equations. And you're going to have to set up your two sets of given and wanted tables, one for each component. Then you're going to have to, while you do this, set a positive and negative direction for the two components, horizontal and vertical. And um, I want you to also, for the positions, set a reference position. Where is the zero for horizontal movement and where is the zero for vertical movement? Where they most help you, and you usually have the freedom to do so. Then you're going to pick a road map. You're going to figure out which equation uh, do I need to use to solve for the exact quantity asked for in this problem or this part of the problem. And you uh, you're going to need to find it to move forward. So you might have to do some investigative work or use more than one equation to get to your desired result. And that's how we do these problems, okay? Just a little review on that, and let's get to a problem. This is a five-part problem about a kicked football, okay? I'm going to show you everything you can be asked when it comes to your uh, kinematic two-dimensional equations and the range formula. So first, this football is kicked at a 37 degree angle with a velocity of 20 meters per second. We have not seen one of these problems where the initial velocity is at an angle and we need to really dive into this because these are the most complicated type of problems you're going to see. So in this first section, uh, part A, we're going to find the maximum height that the football reaches. The maximum height. Okay, the picture is here. It's very clear. The velocity vectors are shown. That's very nice. The initial velocity uh, vector is shown, and the angle is there. It's really nice, and it's asked for the height, the maximum height that the uh, football reaches. So can we use the range formula here? While the range formula could apply to this situation, we're not being asked for the range or any quantity involved in the range. So no, we will not use the range formula here. We're going to have to create our set of given and unwanted tables. What I'd like to do for this problem is I'd like to, since the football initially moves upwards, I'd like to set positive as upwards, and I would also like to set going to the right as positive because the football in the picture moves to the right. And so positive is upwards and to the right uh, is uh, positive as well. So let's continue by uh, resolving the velocity into components. We have to do this because we're given a quantity that's not horizontal or vertical. It's a combination of both. And the initial velocity specifically, we will need to resolve any quantities like that into their components before we can complete the tables. And so in order to resolve this V0 into components, we'll just multiply it by the cosine of 37 for Vx0 like I've done here in this first row. You get 16 approximately meters per second. And then you multiply that initial velocity by sine 37 degrees to get the vertical component, which is smaller because 37 degrees is less than 45. And so you get 12.0 meters per second for the initial vertical velocity. Okay, and it's positive because I chose positive upwards. 
So now we're ready to create our tables. We are given the initial x and y velocities. Also, I'm going to set the initial vertical and horizontal positions to be zero. Because in this problem, when it asks for the maximum height, only a difference matters. So I'll set the initial to zero so that the difference is just that value up there that we're going to eventually find. So x naught and y naught are zero. Also, g is negative. The acceleration due to gravity is negative 9.8 meters per second squared since it points down. Okay, And uh, in addition to that, um, the final horizontal velocity should be the same as the initial because there's no acceleration in projectile motion in the horizontal direction. So that's why Vx and Vx0 are both identical and always will be for your uh, horizontal component of projectile motion. And then over here we see our given y values. Notice that I also added Vy equals 0 meters uh, per second. Excuse me, I have to fix that. There we go. 0 meters per second. Why? Because at the top, think about it. We are turning around when it comes to vertical motion. At the very top, in that split instant in time, when we're at the top, we don't have any vertical velocity. We have zero vertical velocity. That's a very important understanding that the problem picture makes clear. You have to understand that. When you're at the maximum height, your Vy final is zero. Okay. Now, what are our wanted values? Well, I don't know how far it moves horizontally. I don't know the maximum height, which would be the final y value. And I don't know how long it took to get there. So these are my unknowns. Notice how I straddle the t between the two lists because time exists in both lists because it's in both equations and it's the same t. Okay, we've got our table. Now that we have our table, let's get our roadmap. How can we find the maximum height, which is y final? Okay, it's the uh, final position if you set the initial position to zero. It'll just measure that displacement vertically speaking. Great. How are we going to get that knowing everything over here? Well, if we look at over here, we don't have any time, okay? And it's a vertical quantity we're asked for. So that means we're going to have to use a vertical equation that does not have time in it, which would be the bottom one. Let's just check. Do I have Vy? Do I have Vy not? Do I have G? Do I have uh, Y not? Yes, I have all four of those, and Y is the only thing I have to solve for. So we're going to solve this equation for the maximum height, y, and y naught is 0 in this situation because I've set it to be such, as I've said before. So when you set this up, we're going to solve for y algebraically first by first subtracting vy naught squared to the other side, okay, and then dividing by 2g. Now, you might be alarmed saying, hey, 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 hey. Y is 9.8 meters per second squared positive. I thought you said G was negative 9.8 meters per second squared. Notice what they've done here algebraically. In the uh, original equation, it would be Vy squared minus Vy naught squared. Notice how they switched those around. So they've factored out a negative to, in order to switch those around, and they've divided it and canceled it with a negative in the G value. And so everything's fine. Nothing nefarious has been done. We're just using a little algebra manipulation to get rid of some of the negatives. So this is equivalent to 0 minus 12 meters per second squared over 2 times negative 9.8 meters per second squared. So it works fine. When you compute this, you get 7.35 meters, 2 sig figs, uh, actually 3 sig figs, based on the initial calculations and the fact that I'm doing multiplication. So that's the maximum height, 7.35 meters. With a 37 degree kick, uh, that's pretty reasonable with an initial 20 meters per second velocity, and that's because it's such a low angle, okay? It's not gonna get that high. What you're really concerned with is distance. Now we know 45 degrees is gonna give us the most range, but um, this kick wasn't 45 degrees, it was eight degrees less. All right, so that's the maximum height of the football. Now let's move on to part B. Part B asks for the time of travel before the football hits the ground. Okay, so it's asking us for time, clearly. Would we use the range formula for that? No. The range formula has no time information in it. So it's not going to help us find the time. So we're going to need to uh, create our two sets of given and wanted tables. We just have to modify the set we had before. Okay, we're still going to consider positive upwards. We're still going to consider to the right positive. Note the last picture on the last slide. 
but this time I know uh, a few more things. This is the entire trip now. Before the football hits the ground means this is the whole entire trajectory from one side all the way to the other. And so our final y is not the maximum height now. We have to alter it and make it 0, the same as the initial, because it's the entire trip from the ground to the ground. Okay, so now y final is over here. Also, remember the symmetry I showed you in chapter 3, unit 3, uh, excuse me, unit 2, and I revisited in unit 3. If the initial vertical velocity is 12, and it's horizontal level situation, the final vertical velocity will be the opposite in direction, but equal in magnitude, making it negative 12 meters per second. So that's how I've altered the given sets. The um, wanted sets are no different, except my y has moved over, final y. I still don't know how far it moved horizontally, which would be the range, and we could have used that if we were asked for that in this problem, but we weren't. And uh, time, and we still don't know the time, but this time we're asked for it, okay? So the roadmap is going to involve finding the time. So which equation can I use to find the time, given what I know? Well, I'm going to use the second one. I know you can use the first one, but I'm going to use the second one to illustrate something to you. Okay, just in case you didn't know about the symmetry, the negative 12 meters per second, you can use the second one, which doesn't involve the final velocity. Now the second one looks a little scary. I know the initial and final positions are zero, so I could plug in zeros for those two numbers, but VY naught is not zero, it's 12. And so this middle term, t to the first power term, is there to stay. And of course the final one is as well because of the um, fact that g is negative 9.8. Yes, the negative was pulled out by uh, the textbook that did this problem. So now I've got a true quadratic equation when it comes to t and it's equal to zero. But the constant term is zero. So remember from algebra, you could factor out one of the t's from these two terms, giving you this. This is great because this allows you to solve for t two separate ways using the zero product property. One of the results gives you t equals zero. Now that's ridiculous because it's not going to take zero seconds for the football to hit the ground. This solution refers to the initial position of the football on the ground. Of course it would take no seconds for the football to hit the ground if it's already on the ground. The uh, real solution we want is from this linear factor here, 1 half 9.8 t minus 12. And so if you uh, dis uh, set that equal to 0, subtract 12 to the other side, then divide by 1 half, which is the same as multiplying by 2, divide by 9.8, which sends it downstairs, you get this, t equals 2.45 seconds. Awesome. So do not be afraid when uh, your middle term in your second vertical equation is not 0. You can still factor it. Even if the first one isn't zero, you can always use the quadratic formula, negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. That's the sign I used to remember that. You can always use that uh, to solve the second equation for t. So 2.45 seconds is the time for the entire trip, which is pretty short, but um, if that ball's going that fast, that makes sense. So um, what I want to tell you, something this uh, book didn't do, is it plugged in these numbers really early. I would not recommend doing this, okay? It's very easy to get lost in the numbers. I would have gone back to here, set the zeros to be zero, and then solve for t before plugging anything in. It's really generally good practice, in my opinion, to do that because you don't get as lost in the numbers. And I've seen people get lost in the numbers and forget what they're doing or what they're solving for. I would have waited till this point so t was isolated to plug in numbers personally. Okay, that's part B. This is a long one. Things get easier now. How far away it hits the ground? Okay, so if you think back to the last problem we solved for t, only thing left to solve was for x final. Look what the question part C asked for. How far away does it hit the ground? Well, that's x final. And since this football is at level horizontal, range problem because the football starts at the ground and ends at the ground, you can use the range formula to find this final x. All right, so we are going to try it. Um, we're going to choose positive downwards this time, which is generally good practice, 
and uh, choose right as positive because there's no reason not to. Um, this will allow g to be positive. Okay, we want g to be positive in here so that we don't get a negative r. And it's also going to mess up uh, our angle as well. So we're going to choose positive downwards when we use the range formula, generally speaking. Um, the two quantities we know are the angle, theta, and the initial velocity, v0. 20 meters per second and 37 degrees. We're finally using just the bare bones initial quantities given to us. Now we plug them into the formula like this. And g is 9.8 meters per second squared, as we always know. Positive, because positive is downward. We have to multiply the angle we plug in by 2. Okay, do not forget that. So we're really finding the sign of 74 degrees. I didn't get too much into the solution of how this is derived, but the 2 theta is absolutely necessary. So when you compute this, you get the following, 39.2 meters. Okay, let's say you didn't use this. Let's say you didn't think of the range formula. There's actually another way to do it. When you look at these equations, that we found every possible uh, variable except for x final. That means I could easily use this first equation, the second horizontal equation here, excuse me, to really find this value, okay? So you would just modify your given sets of given and wanted tables so that the time was moved from here to here. You'd see that x equals question mark was all that was left, meaning you could use this equation right here. That's the roadmap. You could plug in uh, vx naught and x naught is zero, and uh, you could plug in the t value you got, 2.45 uh, seconds from the last problem, and you will get 39.2 also. So that's probably an easier way to do it, but of course, some people are going to go to the range formula because they're scared of this table of five equations. And the range formula seems like an outlier that's easily used. And that's fine, you get the same answer both ways, your choice. Okay, the last two parts. What is the velocity vector at the maximum height for the football? Okay, this is a purely conceptual question. You need to always look at the drawings and ask yourself, is there a conceptual answer to the question? Look at this, look at this picture, okay? This is the uh, original image I showed you. Look at the uh, maximum height velocity vector. It's purely horizontal, guys. It's purely horizontal. So what does that mean? That means that the uh, velocity vector's horizontal value is the entire velocity vector. But what's even better is that the horizontal velocity is constant in projectile motion. So its initial value, vx0, is equal to this answer that we're trying to find. Okay, we already found this particular uh, value. It was 16 meters per second. And so the total velocity vector at the top Pure horizontal has to be 16 meters per second as well. So all the work was already done. That's truly a whole conceptual question. And the last one, what's the acceleration vector at the maximum height? Okay, so again, is there a way to conceptually answer this question? This one is honestly just uh, trying to trip you up and make you think, oh, I have to do a bunch of work. Oh my gosh, is it very, does it, is, is A, the acceleration different at the top than anywhere else? No. Not for our um, nice, beautiful world in which there's no air resistance. The acceleration vector is constant everywhere. And I know um, those of you who know this stuff very well and you've studied Newton's law of gravitation know that it's slightly different when you're farther away from Earth's surface. But this is we're talking seven meters, okay? This is not, uh, this is vet negligible. So we're going to... Uh, like we said, we're going to treat the acceleration vector as constant in these problems near the Earth's surface. So, the acceleration vector at the maximum height is the same everywhere. Not just at the maximum height, it's the same at the ground. It's the same halfway up. It's the same halfway back down. It's 9.8 meters per second squared, okay? And it points downward. So the full question's answer would be 9.8 meters per second squared downward. So that was a pure conceptual question. So it seems like these parts of this problem kind of got easier as we went along. Okay, we finished that long and drawn out problem. Sometimes you have those on your tests or on your, your, your books. Um, this particular book, The Gioncoli Physics uh, Sixth Addiction, uh, 
sixth edition, excuse me, um, was uh, quite full of those types of many multiple part problems. Okay, one more different problem. Suppose one of Napoleon's cannons had a muzzle velocity of 60 meters per second. At what angle should it have been aimed to strike a target 302 meters away? Okay, all right. So, we get to draw a good picture. Now this would involve some cannon being shooting something and then it landing on the ground somewhere later. Did you see anything about a uh, cliff or anything? No. I saw that y final equals y naught, which means the initial and final positions are the same. And it's asking for an angle to aim the cannon so that its range is 302 meters. So when I ask the question, after the picture is drawn in my head and you've drawn on your papers, would you use the range formula? Oh yeah, baby. That's the only one that has an angle in it. And so that was a good hint, but I needed to check that my initial and final vertical positions were the same. So I can use the range formula, yes. I'm going to choose positive downward, and uh, to the left positive, it really doesn't matter here. Um, let's, if I drew the picture such that the cannon uh, launched the um, cannonball this way, that would make sense. And uh, so we're going to use that range formula. We've got to find the angle this time. Our range is 302 meters given to us. Our initial velocity is 60 meters per second. We've got to find that theta. So first things first please uh, solve for sine 2 theta. Solve for the sine of the ang double angle um, by multiplying both sides by g and dividing both sides by v naught squared. So we end up with this on one side. Now, in order to move forward, in order to get to the angle, I have to do the inverse operation to sine. I have to do the inverse sine to move forward. So uh, the inverse sine will be uh, of 0.821 repeating. When I create this and I plug in 302, 9.8, and 60 squared, um, and I compute that fraction, I get 0.8221 repeating. Then I take the inverse sine of that. This will give me the angle to theta, which is inside the uh, sine right now. Okay, And when I get that, I get 55.297. Make sure your calculators in physics class are in degree mode. There isn't really going to be a time when you need them to be in radian mode. That's more for your pre-cal trade classes and your calculus classes. So when you go to physics class, radian mode is the mode to be in. Then we need to divide that 55.297 divided uh, by 2 to get theta, not 2 theta. And you get 27.6 degrees with three significant figures. That's how many I have in the initial quantities. So that's one angle. There's actually two answers, okay? If you remember my conceptual drawing, uh, this model I had, you saw that the complement of each angle, uh, launch angle, also gave you the same range. So to be fair, there's two angles that will give us the same 302 meter range. The other would be 90 minus our initial answer, 27.6, the complement, which is 62.4 degrees. Both of these angles give us a 302 meters range with a 60 meters per second launch velocity. Okay, so remember that there are two angles because the complement of the angle we got delivers the same range. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. Uh, this video is now finished. You have finished the entire unit on two dimensional kinematics and projectile motion. Thanks for sticking through it. Next chapter is going to be on forces. For now, this is Falconator, signing out.